Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. The saga continues. As of this taping, 75% of the precincts in Iowa have reported their caucus results. We would still like to see full results, but what we have so far is representative of how we expect the final tally to shake out. So here's the picture. Buttigieg leads in terms of state delegate equivalents. That's how the winner of the Iowa caucuses historically would have been decided. He's at 27%, Sanders is at 25%, Warren 18%, Biden 16%, Klobuchar 13%. Now we also have popular vote data. And so looking at that data, the final alignment of the popular vote Sanders leads at 26%, then Buttigieg at 25%, then Warren at 20 Biden a somewhat distant fourth at 14%, Klobuchar at 12%. So we're going to dig into those results a bit more. And here with me to discuss our editor-in-chief, Nate Silver. How's it going? Good. Busy few days here, Gail. Yeah. Had a little time to rest up? <laughs> no, not really. All right. Also with us is politics editor, Sarah Frostenson. How are you? Hey, Galen. I've been better. <laughs> A <laughs> tired crew here. And managing editor Micah Cohen, how are you? I'm good, actually. I was sick. I'm getting better now. Now Sarah's Corona. little Little coronavirus outbreak here at yeah, the office. Exactly. Yeah. Nothing, not a big deal. There were actually very positive reviews of the baritone that you brought to the podcast on Monday night. My brother sent me a text message that he prefers my voice that way. It's pretty. Um, so. Also, Claire Malone is on the road in New Hampshire at the moment, and we're going to check in with her a little bit later. We're also going to talk briefly about the Senate impeachment trial vote today. By the time you are listening to this, we expect that President Trump will have been acquitted by a near party line vote. We did, however, get news today that Republican Senator Mitt Romney of Utah will be voting to convict the president, as will Democratic Senator Doug Jones of Alabama. We're still waiting on a couple others. But Romney will be the first senator in American history to vote to remove a president of his own party in a Senate impeachment trial. We will get to that later. But for now, let's focus on the results in Iowa. So how much do we think these numbers with 75% of the precincts reporting could change by the time we get the final results? Well, I just defer 100% to the upshot. Their numbers say what we have so far is quite representative, that Buttigieg is an 86% favorite to win the majority of uh, state delegate equivalents, which is the uh, uh, measure that media is paying the most attention to, even though it's weird. Um, that Sanders is about a 60-40 favorite to win the final vote after reallocation, and that Sanders is a clear favorite to win the initial vote preference. And those um, are more like the popular vote, right? It's So the first one's like the popular vote when you just come in initially your caucus site. The second one's after you realign in groups. And we should say, by the way, Sanders did not gain very much from that initial grouping to the second grouping. Not many people that were not with Bernie initially join Bernie. In fact, like if we look at our model and try to project this out, if you get 24% statewide, 24.3% statewide in the first vote, and only 26.1% on the final vote, that's like a lot weaker than we would have expected on average. So it means that Bernie was um, not persuading people in these rooms to, to join him if, if they weren't behind him initially, which is a little bit of a bearish sign. With that said, the Democratic Party of all parties should not really be giving alternative measures, in my view, to the popular vote, right? Um, state dele delegate equipments are kind of like the Electoral College or something, right, where they put more weight on rural areas. Um, and that is what currently is putting Buttigieg ahead. He may catch up in the vote after relocation. It is close, 0.8 percentage points. But, um, but you know, that is the reason why most media accounts currently have Buttigieg leading Iowa is because of this this rather strange thing called state delegate equivalence. And it is worth noting that that's traditionally how the winner of Iowa would have been reported. Well, and so some traditions are dumb. And it's totally fair yeah, to but, criticize. Okay. But I thought of the Electoral College, too, actually, as a as a as a good proxy for it. Um, and it's weird and you could call it dumb. But after the fact, making a big deal out of it is a little weird and reminds me of people who sort of were like, well, Trump's not my president because of the Electoral College. And it's like, look, like it, it is what it is. We had it going in. You knew about the system beforehand. Yeah. So I, let me, as a big cr critic of the state delegate equivalent, I mean, let me say two things. Number one, I'm not sure it was totally obvious um, 
how the media would cover this ahead of time. And we, we talked to different news organizations. We talked to, um, we had a meeting with the Democratic National Committee. Can I say that? That came and talked to all the networks, right? Um, we talked to other journalists. We talked to our colleagues at ABC. And it kind of, it seemed like there would be a little bit of a thumb on the scale for state equivalents because like that is traditional way, right? And that's what we get the AP check mark. But like when you turn on, CNN, was it yesterday? It's I, I'm losing track of time, right? Turn on CNN, first results come in, they're like, Buttigieg ahead! It's not Buttigieg wins one count and Sanders ahead in one count, right? Um, and so, like, so I'm not sure we totally anticipated how the media would cover it. With that said, I think the better defense is, like, these were the rules of the game that all candidates abided by, and that Buttigieg had a, had a, had a deliberate strategy to, um, to do well in the rural counties, right? He had a lot of investment in Iowa, a lot of money there. Maybe he would have spent more time in Des Moines and Iowa City and the suburbs if he had alternate rules and then won that other way as well. So, so, but I am sympathetic to any Democrat who says, look at the popular vote. I mean, that seems like it should be the official position of the party, I think. So the reality is, right, that we have a long way to go before there's any official winner in this nominating process. And for now, for our purposes at 538, we have two or we have three data points that we can work off of in terms of of analyzing what happened and how things will shake out going forward. So let's leave that there for now. Sarah, how surprising are these results compared with the data and forecasts that we had going into Iowa? Yeah, I mean, it's clear that Buttigieg overperformed where we had him in our polling average and where he'd been in recent polls before Iowa. There's no question whether or not you think the SDEs are a fair metric that he did well on that front. Sanders at 22 percent in our polling average um, was about roughly where we thought he would be. And I think the biggest surprise, though, was that Biden did so poorly. Right. I mean, in the unreleased DMR poll that was captured him in fourth as well. I thought it was surprising, though, that he did come in overall fourth in Iowa when really we'd had him as projected maybe a second. That was a surprise to me. So. Sanders actually did, if you look at the vote after realignment, which is what we project, we projected Sanders for 28% and he got 24. So um, we have a very wide range, it was between 14 and 43. So all these people are well within the range, but like, but because Sanders did not convert very many people on the second preference, then he underperformed a little bit. That process only applies in Iowa and Nevada and then four states that are small states that have ranked choice voting. But it's more a ominous sign about Bernie's ability to kind of consolidate the rest of the party later. And I don't want to editorialize too much, but like here you have this result in Iowa. That's pretty good for Bernie. Um, He's going to move up in our model. The model's already published by now, right? It helped him in our model. He probably has the best chance of anybody to win, even though no one has a particularly solid chance, right? It's pretty wide open. Um, and instead, some of the discussion online kind of concerns like, oh, you know, Iowa Democratic Party, how dare they screw this up? And they did make a massive screw up. But like some of these things could actually help Sanders, right? If it turns out that Buttigieg wins, the metric the media pays attention to, it's actually kind of nice for Sanders that um, it's seen as messy and he did pretty well. And I don't know. Um but Sanders has to pivot at some point from um, from being a factional candidate and having the largest faction to being the candidate of at least a majority of the party, if not the whole party. Um, and this is a little bit bearish for that. Yeah. And that's been our question about Sanders all along is, is he more than a factional candidate? I don't think Iowa shows otherwise. It doesn't prove he is a factional candidate, but doesn't show that he isn't. But I think we're burying the lead a little bit here. And Sarah got at what it is, which is, look, Buttigieg, I think, overperformed the average, you know, vote share projection in our forecast a bit. Um, Sanders under underperformed a bit. They're all well within the kind of conf- 80 percent confidence intervals we had. But the big story here is Biden way underperforming. Even Biden, as, as Sarah said, is like within that confidence interval. But Biden did terribly in Iowa. He's the former vice president. He was the nominal front runner in this race, even if he wasn't, you know, a favorite favorite. Um, and he finished fourth. Now, Iowa, New Hampshire, these were never supposed to be super strong states for for Biden. 
but there's a there's a lot of space between okay this isn't a great state for me and I'm finishing fourth. More, to- though, than Buttigieg, because Buttigieg overperformed his polls by a decent amount, right? Like, he was a pretty distant much? third and actually ended up coming in with 25% in the reallocation. Like, he was in the team. I, so I, I think you guys are I – I think that's kind of wrong. I mean, I think that's neglecting – how much uncertainty there is in the Iowa polls, right? Especially with all this realignment and stuff. So we had Buttigieg in the polls. He's at um, whatever, 15 or 16, but that doesn't account for undecided. undecided. So you get a little bit from that. It doesn't account for the fact that you have 10% going to candidates who are non-viable in almost every district. So we had him forecasted to win 19% after realignment. He I won 25%, t- but with a range of 5 to 33. So he's kind of in that fairly thick part of the range. By the way, I misspoke earlier. Sanders got 26%, not 24% on the second realignment, which is actually not far from our 28%, but a little to the to the low side. I don't think Buttigieg overperformed by much. I think primary polls are inexact. Once you allocate undecided and you know realignment votes, I think uh, Buttigieg did well. There's no bones about that, you know. But but he mostly, in part, he moved up just because Biden moved down, right? Um, and and Warren, I think, did Warren underperform a little bit? She overperformed, actually. Um, she's kind of the hidden story here. Has not gotten very much press coverage, but she was forecasted to win 16% after realignment and won 20%. Biden is the story, right? Because the biggest winner in Iowa, I mean, the biggest literal winner, we can have this conversation about kind of how you split credit, but the biggest practical winner is Buttigieg, and he is out of the top four or five candidates, or top four at least, the one who has the most trouble taking that momentum, which might be substantial, but turning that into like an actual winning map because of his lack of support outside of college educated white voters. Um, And so, you know, so every candidate was kind of hoping that um, that if someone won Iowa and it wasn't them, that it was Buttigieg, Um, which again is not to discount. I mean, we're obviously always thinking one step ahead here. You have the um, the first major gay candidate for president and he wins the only contest we've had so far or co-wins the only contest probably that we've had so far um that's big and historic and you know he's the mayor of south Bend, indiana and he he is one of the co-winners if not the winner of the iowa caucus right that's like that's pretty impressive it's a kind of story that might lead to a pretty big bounce there's already some evidence that in new hampshire that he has had a bounce and new hampshire is another state that he could win where do we go from there? That's why the model is like, okay, this is still a long shot. Um, but it doesn't mean that what he accomplished wasn't impressive. Nate, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned that Buttigieg's base is college-educated white voters. We have a little more data now on what the candidates' bases are actually are. And it seemed like Buttigieg did well in rural areas in particular, actually. Sarah, I think you looked into some of the crosstabs on the entrance polls. What does the support look like for these different candidates? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, you know, confirms, I think, ideas we already had going in. Um, For instance, Sanders does really well with young people, right, especially those under the age of 30. It starts to taper off in around the age of 40, where Buttigieg, Biden have more of an advantage. Um, Similarly to what Nate was saying earlier about Buttigieg having a real strategy of going for rural counties in Iowa, that was reflected also in the exit polls in terms of support. But again, I think speaking to Biden's lack, you know, if his electability argument is, I am for the working class. I can win back the Obama-Trump voters. Um, He did not perform well with those um, voters, uh, at least those without a college degree. They broke for, without a college degree, they broke for Sanders, which I thought was telling as well uh, for, you know, casting ahead. And unfortunately, because Iowa is so predominantly white, there's not a lot of cross tabs um, on race there to better understand what candidates' bases could look like moving forward. But Sanders definitely on the age front, um, but then also for the more quote unquote working class seems to have an advantage. Now that we have three quarters of the results in, we at 538 are updating our forecast for the rest of the nominating contest and can start to see a picture of how Iowa changed things. So Nate, Mm. how did the Iowa caucuses their their muddled results change our forecast. So 
it's good news if you're a fan of uncertainty <laughs> and chaos. <laughs> Who is it? Um, let's go one by one. And I, we should say this is based on um, the probabilistic assessment that Budicic will probably win. But we don't give him full credit for a win yet. And also, even if he were to win one count, we still give partial credit to Bernie based on these other popular vote counts. We'll explain that on the site later on. Um, we actually have Sanders up to a 40% chance of winning the delegate majority. Um, he was at about 30% before Iowa. Um, we have Biden down to 20% from about 42% before. Um, we have... Buttigieg up less than you might think. He's at 5%. He was at 4% before, but that's for a majority. If you look for a plurality, then he's at 8%. And that might be a little conservative on his balance. But remember, the model is going through sequentially one state at a time. And it is saying um, that, hey, actually, I'm not sure that you're viable after New Hampshire, or you have to prove it to me by getting a big bounce in national polls and polls in states in the South and so forth. Um, we actually have Warren's chances up a little bit. Maybe that's not reflected in the media narrative about the race, but she is up um, to a 9% chance of plurality, excuse me, a 9% chance of a majority, and 13 of a plurality. Um, partly this is because- um, From where? Where was she before? She had been down to like five of a majority. Um, partly this is because the model thinks that um, the front runner in national polls, namely Biden, is liable to decline, um, that Sanders is likely stuck in neutral-ish. We'll see what happens, right? And so all of a sudden, um, if you're sitting at 15% like Warren is and Bernie's at 22 or something, you're not that far out of the lead. It's different when you had someone at 26 or 27 like Biden was. I know it seems like a marginal factor, right? But, um, but you know, that actually helps. Even Bloomberg now gets a little bit on the board, very long shot to win a majority, but like he's at his highest number of delegates that we forecast. Let me look at this now. So we now have Bloomberg projected for 239 delegates. But I skipped over one big headline here, which is that nobody is doing well. The Meaning literally, the chance that no one wins a majority is up to 26%. From? From 17% beforehand. So, um, so yeah. Um, All right. So Micah and Sarah, how much does this change your conception of the race just that one messed up night in iowa it seems like has shaken things up a lot actually you, you, well yes and no i, th I think it, the big shakeup is is the decline mm -hmm. in biden's chances but actually biden as i said earlier wasn't an overwhelming favorite to begin with so it is sort of what nate said earlier in that it's like the storyline going into iowa was Hey, this is a wide open race and something of a mess. The story, the storyline coming out of Iowa is like this is really f***ing wide open and a huge f***ing mess. I think. I think that's fair, but I mean, right? I'm trying to remember now, but right before Iowa, it was Sanders and Biden were kind of more clustered, right? And it was still wide open. That's definitely how we described it. But Warren and Buttigieg were both more thought of as kind of long shots. And Biden has just fallen so dramatically. And, then, you know, New Hampshire is another state for him that's not particularly strong or he's not expected to do well. Um, but part of me wonders, you know, say Sanders wins New Hampshire, then say Sanders, you know, goes on to win Nevada. Will Biden really be able to make a recovery at that point in South Carolina, particularly if it's not Biden coming in second or Biden coming in third, but it's like Biden coming in fourth? And like Klobuchar was what? How many points away from Biden? Yeah, she Well, <laughs> she, that, she that, took that narrative is, I don't know. I mean, in the end, I think Warren was closer to Biden than she was to the front runners, right? Depends yeah. on which metric you look at, because there's lots of, you know. Yeah, Warren was was a distant third, as, yeah. as far look, as things go. It's a perfectly solid fourth. The problem is that it's fourth, yeah. and right. there's no good version of fourth place. Um, and in New Hampshire, we can give you our forecast for New Hampshire, too. Um, so currently, Sanders has a 68% chance of winning New Hampshire. You want to guess who's number two? We're looking at it. Buttigieg, so I, I Buttigieg is number two with a 19% chance. 
Warren a 7% chance, Biden a 6% chance, Klobuchar a 1% chance. Okay, wait, I want to focus in on that for a second. So Biden has a 6% chance of winning New Hampshire. After having my like nose in the books for the past like two to three months on primary history, I know that there has only been one instance of somebody going on to win their party's nomination after not winning either Iowa or New Hampshire since 1976. That one person was Bill Clinton in 92. So, you know, obviously that data is what it is. Biden may still have a 20 percent chance of winning the nomination. You know, things are still up in the air. However, historically speaking, it's only happened once that somebody hasn't won either okay. Iowa or New Hampshire. So historically speaking, though, it's a small sample size. I understand. Historically speaking, there are more sophisticated ways to look at it, right? I, okay. like, here's the way I would put it. I, I think the million dollar question is the one Sarah brought up, which is if Biden can't manage a kind of reversal of narrative in the first few states, how well does his support in South Carolina, particularly among non-white voters, black voters in particular, how well does that hold up? That's the million dollar question here, right? Because first of all, we could get a surprise in New Hampshire, right? So that surprise could be Sanders. Um, I'm sorry, Sanders wouldn't be the surprise, right? Sanders winning would be somewhat, un somewhat expected. Buttigieg would be a little surprising, though, you know, following up with some momentum from Iowa, you can kind of see it, right? Um, Biden's problem is that if you were trying to pinpoint a surprise in, in New Hampshire, like remember Obama wins Iowa in 2008, everyone thinks he's going to win New Hampshire, then Clinton does. You would think Warren would actually play that role this year before Biden. You get what I mean? Like even if there's a surprise in New Hampshire, it might not be Biden. Um, and then the question is, what happens to his support among black voters if he's losing, losing, losing? I'm not sure it's obvious that it that it goes away, right? Like we had plenty of storylines through the course of this primary about Biden stumbles, Biden gaffes, um, that didn't really make a dent in his support. Now, maybe nobody was paying attention to those and now they're paying attention, but I don't know, maybe maybe his support just holds I mean, up let's, in South Carolina and he's fine. Let me say one thing out of an abundance of caution, just like the Iowa Democratic Party, abundance of caution. Um, don't you don't want to throw your line with the I, Iowa Democrats, Nate? The model is anticipating that Biden will decline in national and New Hampshire polls as a result of Iowa. That hasn't happened yet, or it hasn't. Or actually, he kind of did decline in one of the New Hampshire polls, but like we don't have very much evidence of that yet, right? So it's possible just that like you know his base doesn't care about it that much. He's been pretty steady before. He declines from twenty six percent to twenty three percent, which isn't great, but like that would still leave him probably in this three or four way pile up with Sanders and and no one and Buttigieg or whatever. Right. Um, although Buttigieg is quite far behind and more we should say. So like if he like just kind of holds steady, then it's a different story. Um, yeah. I mean, the question is like right now with Biden declining, there is no obvious winner in South Carolina. Right. Bernie definitely has more african-american and hispanic support than like Buttigieg, for example so it might be him if biden is really in trouble um but clearly like you wouldn't say that bernie sanders is inherently a strong south carolina candidate but neither i mean all they're all very northern right yeah. sanders and warren and Buttigieg are all super freaking northern Klo um klobuchar maybe klobuchar is super northern midwestern here's a question if you take, okay, we have this new forecast in New Hampshire. If you take everyone's chances of winning as a stock price, basically. So Sanders, Jesus, my eyesight is terrible. Sanders is has a two and three chance, 68%. Buttigieg, 19%. Warren, 7%. Biden, 6%. Klobuchar, essentially 1%. Whose price do you think is most undervalued sanders is is a healthy favorite now at 68 percent that seems pretty well priced to me i think buddha judge is undervalued there well remember we're kind of giving him credit for three quarters of a bounce or 70 percent of a bounce based on not actually knowing the final iowa result yeah so he'll move up a bit further if that confirms that he won at least the state delegate equivalence part of it right 
but there's still a chance that late returns do go for Bernie, and then all of a sudden he's robbed of this momentum. So that's all priced into the model. It is worth noting, though, that when we're talking about Buttigieg's odds in New Hampshire, he showed us in the past that there is a coalition there for him that can get him to the front of the pack. He was leading in New Hampshire polls previously in the cycle. So if he can kind of reconsolidate that, then yeah, you do see a path for Buttigieg in New Hampshire. I mean, um, yeah, like he's a fairly good New Hampshire candidate. He has actually, it was always these two states, not just the one where he was polling like fairly well. By the way, he has moved up in some of the initial New Hampshire polling. Um, so yeah, maybe he's, you know, I don't know. I mean, the thing that I think we haven't accounted for is like, this model is trying to, in essence, like predict what the media narratives and storylines that voters hear and tell themselves are after Iowa, right? And its inference is that Bernie has a slightly positive storyline because he kind of partly won and partly winning is good because most candidates don't win at all. Um, if it begins to be spun as a um, loss, quote unquote, and that there's infighting within the Sanders camp about how to treat these results and their grievances against the Iowa Democratic Party, which of course there should be, right? But if that's the headline, it's usually not a good headline for you. And um, his turnout didn't happen, which is a negative for Bernie. If it starts to be spun as a loss, then all of a sudden, New Hampshire, a state where people can switch their vote fast, um, he kind of becomes like a little bit of a, of a softer target there. And I don't know, right? The other result in this updated forecast that we haven't dug into too much, and I, I think we will continuously over the coming months, so we won't get into it too much now because I want to talk about impeachment, is now a 25% chance that it's nobody. That, that's crazy. Sarah, <laughs> as the person who coordinates our political coverage, how does that oh make you gosh. feel? Uh, well, it's everyone's dream, right? If we have a contested convention, we all uh, salivate over that each year. But yeah, no, I mean, that it, it just does go to show how wide open the field is, right? I know we keep saying that, but that really is true. It's just, it's mind blowing to me that that's next after Sanders. Sarah, remember when I slacked you a couple months ago and said, hey, I'm thinking about scheduling my vacation over the summer during the Democratic convention. And I said that was fine. Yeah. yeah no. I think that <laughs> I just wanted to get that on the Sarah, record. Sarah, would you like to take that permission back now? I think so. Yeah. All right. Uh, Michael, no cancel your vacation. No I think that might backs. be low, by the way, because um, of Bloomberg. And I'm a pessimist about Bloomberg's ability to win the nomination Certainly as a majority. But you're an right? optimist about his ability to cause chaos. I'm an optimist about, I'm actually a slight pessimist, but I'm relatively compared to my pessimism over his majority chances that like, if you have someone who is deliberately trying to say, I'm going to try to get as many delegates as possible and see what happens. And to me, that's the subtext of a lot of the uh, Bloomberg campaign. Then... That creates an issue, right? Because the 76% of the time people win a majority, if you look at that and break it down in our numbers, a lot of those are narrow. They just get over the finish line, so it's a majority and not a plurality. So if Bloomberg takes even 7% of delegates or something, then like all of a sudden you might be up to a one in three chance of no majority. It's also a little bit self-fulfilling. What if Warren says, well, I'm in third place behind some of these white guys, but nobody's going to get a majority but no anyway. But nobody's going to get a majority, so I and I actually can be out. a compromise, that I'm more experienced, a Buttigieg, the Sanders people can live with me, the Biden people are 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 will learn to live with me, right? Um, I'm going to run a good campaign, be very professional. So all of a sudden, if because, you know, this assumes, our forecast assumes that people drop out when they don't have a shot. If it begins to seem like Nobody no one's going to win a majority— shot then no one has a shot, right? And then everyone stays in. And so it, it like, you know, even, I think this is less likely, but you could even have like Klobuchar say, I'm gonna stay in and get my Minnesota delegates or whatnot. All right, well, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, Claire is on the road in New Hampshire, getting some of the reactions of the candidates to the Iowa results and seeing how they're planning to chart their path to victory next Tuesday. Claire, how's it going? It's great. As I was just saying to you guys, I pulled up to this event stop I'm at and realized that I've been here before. I've been to this brewery before on another campaign stop. So um, that is how New Hampshire is. 
<laughs> slightly repetitive, cold, and uh, currently no snow. Well, at least, you know, clear roads, but other things, some things never change. So how are the candidates spinning the results on the ground in New Hampshire after Iowa? So you guys are catching me. Um, I drove up very early this morning from New York to New Hampshire. So I have only seen Biden in person um, and I am about to walk into a Warren event. But Biden was, um, I I think, kind of an interesting uh, speaker this morning in New Hampshire, he kind of took a bit of a, of an underdog stance in some ways, which is interesting for the national front runner. You know, he basically said it was a gut punch in Iowa. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, and he, uh, said things like, you know, people say that this camp, people have said that this campaign couldn't last. We're proving them wrong. And then he took, um, explicit shots at Pete Buttigieg, all the other, candidates, he sort of euphemistically would say one of my opponents or whatever it was. Um, But Buttigieg, he called out specifically by name and said, you know, he thinks that I'm part of the old Washington, um, you know, establishment, part of the problem. But listen, you know, I got I got the Affordable Care Act done. And, you know, I did all this stuff with foreign policy. Right. So um, it's interesting to have the national front runner be talking that way in New Hampshire. So I think you're, you know, you're certainly, um, you're certainly seeing Biden's team or Biden's campaign um, be a bit, uh, I guess I I would call it a little bit back on their heels. Uh, We'll see what Warren, um, Warren won't actually be at this event I'm walking into. It's, it'll be surrogates, but I'm, I'm, I'm mostly focusing on talking to voters um, on this trip and just um, really trying to get a, a, a people's sense of things as they, as we head into what I think I, I will call the first um, organized vote of the Democratic primary season. <laughs> um, Come on, Claire. There's no need to kick Iowa while it's down. Plenty of people are doing that. <laughs> no, I'm actually serious about that. I think that um, it 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 makes the um, the choices of people in New Hampshire a bit more uh, fuzzy. So you've still got people who are deciding, you know, you still got people who are candidate shopping these last few days. Um, and that's gonna continue. So, um, kind of interesting to see what's on people's minds. What else have you heard from voters? Anything specific about how they're reacting to the new, anything specific about how they're reacting to the Iowa result? Well, you know, New Hampshireites are, are obviously of a similar, breed to Iowa voters and that they take great pride in their state. So I've heard people say, well, the primary process is better than the caucus process. And, you know, like we, we do it better here. So, you know, they really, they really screwed it up. So it's that kind of thing. Um, I don't think if you went to like, you know, talk to random people in, you know, Illinois or Michigan or something that they that they'd have specific views about the caucuses versus the primaries, but New Hampshire voters do have that. But mostly I think they're kind of they are a bit like tunnel vision um, with their own state, with their own vote. And you hear a lot of, you know, at the the Biden event, you heard a lot of sort of the pragmatic um, kind of voter, even if they hadn't made up their mind. Yeah, that's interesting to hear, Claire. Um, the more I think we've sat with the Iowa results and we're about to um, we were talking about this earlier, but we're about to update our forecast and it shows with the partial Iowa results and it shows Biden's chances plummeting. Um but are you, Sarah or Claire or Galen, surprised that Biden has so explicitly acknowledged and taken on the hit? Um, wh- I guess I maybe I just sort of expected him more to be like, Iowa was never really our state. We have a diverse coalition and blah, blah, blah. So it's I'm a bit surprised that he's he's. He's saying what, Cl- you know, what Claire said. I mean, he's still talking to New Hampshire crowds, right? You know, I think if he were if he were appearing on a yeah, national, true, me- very na- true. <laughs> national media program, he might say, listen, I've got a super diverse coalition, people of all economic and ec- economic um, and educational backgrounds support me. But in New Hampshire, you got to you got to play to the crowd. You got to play to the scene. Um, but. You know, I think what is interesting about Biden as a candidate, which I think people are starting to see a little bit more, is um, he gets angry about this stuff. You know, he's um, 
he ha- he got protesters during his event this morning, mostly younger, although not all. They were kind of climate change protesters, and he gets a little ticked off at them. He's he's certainly fired up, right? As you as one would imagine, a person who has just finished in a poor position, um, in the in the first you know, vote for president would be. Um, But he sounded a little hoarse this morning. You know, he's really, I got to say, he's really working the aviators brand hard, even in the sort of not that sunny New Hampshire sunlight. They're uh, glued to his face. Um, But he is, you can, you can palpably sense the frustration from time to time. And, and you've seen it in sort of some of these little viral videos that will go around when people in Iowa would come up to him and say, um, you know, can you please answer my question about climate change or whatever it is? Um, And Biden gets a little confrontational or he'll say, um, he said this morning to the protesters, don't be like the Trumpsters. Be polite. I'll talk to you afterwards. Don't interrupt. Right. Um, So I, you do get the real sense that Biden, the man, is frustrated. I'm curious, Claire, in like talking with voters, do any of them seem to kind of be grappling with Biden coming in fourth in Iowa? Do they seem shaken at all? Or is that not really factoring in? Not the voters I talk to. Again, you know, if you're you're going to a Biden (laughs) event, you might be a little more in the tank. But people mostly keep on coming back to um, we need a pragmatic stopgap measure, you know, to get us out of Trump, right? These are pra- these are pragmatic voters that you're getting at these Biden events. So I'm interested to see what, say, like a Buttigieg voter or a Klobuchar voter might say about you know someone who's sh- who's still shopping candidates, who's got you know the three the three moderates on their plate, um, whether or not they're freaked out. But no, I mean I think you still hear um, very similar lines about. If they choose, if we choose Warren or Sanders, then we're going to lose the general election. You know, that's the kind of that's the kind of thing you hear at a Biden event. And that I think that's been true for, you know, the past 10 months, whatever it is. That makes sense. And, and you wouldn't think Biden would have to sell those voters to stay with him on that argument, which is why it's not surprising to me, Claire, what you said about Biden going after Buttigieg, because um, Buttigieg very much is in his lane. Right. And the more Buttigieg gains momentum, that comes not one for one, but it comes, di- you know, a lot of it comes directly from from Biden. So, yeah, I think I think we have to expect to see Biden go pretty hard after Buttigieg over the next few days and weeks. Claire, I want to let you get to this Warren rally. But before you leave us, you did spend some time actually following Buttigieg around in Iowa and profiling his communications director, Liz Smith. And so I know you're focused on New Hampshire right now, but what is your sense, given the reporting that you did, of how Buttigieg pulled out his victory or half victory, whatever you want to call it, from Iowa? Yeah, I mean, you know, they, well, first of all, they they camped him out there in that state for the past year. Um, and I think a lot of this has to do with, you know, listen, a year ago, People didn't know who Pete Buttigieg was, really. You know, we knew who he was because this is our job and we're supposed to know that. Um, But Liz Smith, who I did profile for New York Magazine, check it out online. Um, Her whole thing was, along with his, you know, his campaign manager and his strategist, but their whole thing was just get him out there and in front of all the TV cameras, camp him out in a state he can win. I mean, you know, I know Liz read a lot of has read up on a lot of Jimmy Carter stuff, right? So the 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 um, wholesome newcomer, you know, wholesome outsider comes and 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 makes a stand and and takes Iowa and sort of um, you know goes on to the presidency. I think is a certainly a path that they uh, aspire to in some ways. So that campaign is um, is savvy, right? Like I think you see. Um, Pete is a political animal, right? And I think you saw that in his decision, in the campaign's decision to come out with that pretty bold speech on, what was it, Tuesday night, Monday night? I have no idea what sense of time. Monday night, saying, we won the caucuses. I mean, that's that's kind of ballsy, right? Like, that's a risky move. It looks like it's paid off um, because the past two days on cable, since no one had anything to do, um, because we're all waiting for Iowa results, people kept on saying Pete Buttigieg declared victory. And even if you put in all the caveats, um, you know, that's still 
that's still your name out there. That's still your name next to winning, victory, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, I think we, we do come back to what happens when you start hitting these super diverse states, right, where Buttigieg doesn't have any any hold. And I think that's the huge glaring flaw of their campaign. All right. Well, we will see what happens. But thank you, Claire, for checking in with us. Of course. And uh, good luck with everything in New Hampshire. Thanks. Bye, Claire. Bye, guys. One final thing before we let you all go. By the time you are listening to this, the Senate will have almost certainly voted to acquit President Trump in his impeachment trial. We did find out, though, earlier today that Senator of Utah Republican Mitt Romney decided to vote to convict the president. Sarah, how much of a surprise is that? I think it is a surprise. Um, I think when, gosh, it was last Friday. It's so funny. Uh, But when the vote for more witnesses failed, I think at that point, you know, it was like, oh, this is on track for acquittal of the president, which it still is. But thinking that, well, if no Republicans broke rank then to ask for more evidence that they wouldn't actually vote um, against the president. And in fact, um, this is the first senator to vote to convict a president of his own party, which is notable. He voted only for one of the two articles. He voted for abuse of power, but not on the second, on obstruction. But I mean, it's not going to earn him any friends on the Republican aisle. I do think it was unexpected and is a big deal for him to have done that. I mean, what does he do now? Does he leave the Republican Party? Does he not want to run for reelection? What's like, is it all just principle? Can we, should we throw aside our cynical notions of how people behave in politics? He, he definitely framed it as, you know, something from his faith. He's a devout um, Mormon and I think grappled with it in those terms. But Utah is also kind of a weird state. I feel like if you could get away with being kind of a renegade Republican there. It's almost like Murkowski in Alaska, right? Um, and granted, she had different circumstances as actually running as a run <laughs> or a write-in at one point. But I think I think Romney runs again, But um, and maybe that will hurt him at the ballot in Utah. But I also think within um, more fundamental Christianity, Mormons are also a little more anti-Trump than other sects. All right. So... As we wrap up this impeachment saga to some degree, this is something we've covered for months now. Micah, Nate, what are your closing thoughts on the day that Trump is acquitted? First of all, Mitt Romney voting for one article of impeachment, I am taking as evidence that I was right all along, that people were underrating the chances that (laughs) Republicans would abandon Trump. That is spin, folks. That is what spin looks like. You're aware it was a two-thirds vote. It didn't fail by two votes here. It was. I'm just like saying. I'm just saying. 48 out of 67. I'm just saying that people were not expecting Romney to vote for either article of impeachment, uh, and he did, and he's a Republican. Let's just leave it there, okay, agree to disagree. Second, um, this the, the implications of this are— Vast and unknown, I think, is probably the safest way to put it. Um, but then couldn't they also be small? <laughs> if they're no, I, th- I think I. Th- but that's my point is like, I think we know they're not small. I think we don't know, but I think we can safely bet. I mean, you have a president um, in office who really beyond the shadow of a doubt is has manipulated far you know government policy foreign policy for his own personal gain and his party stuck by him right um our our presidents now in, a, in other words impeachment has now been shown given modern polarization to be mostly impotent right to be the the tool doesn't work anymore um so maybe at some point some president could do something that that would you know, trigger a, a kind of more re, a more real impeachment trial. Um, but this didn't do it. So, like, w- what is Trump thinking now? Does Trump just think he can do whatever he wants? What do presidents that come after Trump, um, how do they view this? Essentially, the country does not have a way right now, realistically, to remove a president from office, right? Except th- at the ballot box. Maybe that's enough. Maybe every four years is often enough that, you know, 
we, we make do with that. The founders didn't think so. The founders thought we needed a, a tool in between elections to remove a president. It doesn't seem like we have that tool. That seems like a big deal, right? Well, there's also an argument that it never actually worked to begin with. We've never had a president ever be impeached and convicted and removed from office. We had that's Nixon. Nixon. Yeah, it worked with Nixon. Point. Yeah, it worked with Nixon. Nixon would have been impeached in the House and I would mean, have so been what, removed in the One Senate. way to put it is the threshold is crazily high. Incredibly high. And that Nixon, who I'm not a constitutional scholar or historian, you know, it seems to me that what Trump did and what Nixon did are in the same ballpark. Okay. Um, but Nixon came at a time when there was much less partisanship than there is now. Um, if Trump, if, I don't know what the Donald Trump of the 1970s was, um, but if he were. It was kind of Nixon. Yeah. Not really. Well, no. okay. <laughs> if he were in a Congress where like everyone is Susan Collins or Mitt Romney, then I'm not sure that he gets gets um, acquitted necessarily. Um, and so I don't know. I mean, if you kind of put it in like a big regression equation, right? And you're kind of like, where because we tried to do this. Remember back in yeah. 2017, we're like, if you were to build a model of impeachment, what would you look at? And like one of the big things is like, how strong are these partisan forces and stuff like that? Um, Trump, by the way, is also sort of, I mean, he's not popular, but he's not super unpopular, right? He's at 40, actually up, you know, 43, 44% in our averages. Um, was at 42 percentage before impeachment. The economy is pretty good. It is the first term. Um, cause remember impeachment is a remedy for all types of crimes, um, in the constitution, including for people who are not elected officers. Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily clear that the founders solely intended this for the cases where you had a president on the ballot in another year. So I don't know. I, I think it's like kind of, I am just in general, someone who is resistant to narratives that like, um, oh, now things are permanently changed. Um, I think if we had been here um, before 2016 and had been told Donald Trump will become president, here will be the allegations against him, we want you to game out what will happen, I think we would have not predicted that he would have been Rem removed. I think we would have predicted something very much like what happened, actually. That would have taken quite the imagination to come up with that. Well, idea before 2016. But that a president in this environment doing Nixon levels of stuff, given how much higher partisanship is right now in his first term with a 42 percent approval rating. You know, I don't think we would have thought that president would. We might have thought there were a few more votes for conviction. That, yeah, that would be that would. Have, Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, we're going to leave things there as folks know because I've been talking about our live show, we're going to be in New Hampshire this weekend. So we will have a post-debate reaction podcast on Friday. We'll be at the debate in Manchester, New Hampshire. Then we have our live show on Sunday night, which will be in your podcast feeds on Monday, kind of like our regular Monday podcast. Then we're also still going to be in New Hampshire on Tuesday for a primary reaction podcast. Hopefully things go more smoothly this time, but uh, we'll be with you either way. So check in often for updates in your feed, but that's it for now. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Galen. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Galen. And thank you, Micah. Thank you. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the control room. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.